Okay, again, thank you, Vivian, for the work you guys are doing. And again, thank you guys for being a wonderful audience and being so supportive of the ministry here. Um, one of the things I have to say to you, you know, we, we have raised money through this, this whole process. And even tonight, um, I know the church has put out a bit of money there. One of the things Amir keeps telling me, stop raising money. I don't ask for money because the wonderful thing about these guys, when they came out here, they've supplied their own funding to get here to the hotels, the accommodation, everything like that. We just felt as South Africans that we don't want to be the, the ones that are just benefiting off the rest of the world. So while we are drawing a bit of money ourselves to pay for some of the extras, things that happen around the churches that we're setting up, any money that's going to be left over there, we want to bless Behold Israel from our South African side. So just a hands off. Thank you guys for what you've done. And uh, they would have been here even if none of us had contributed one cent. And so thank you. And so we're going to hand over, I'm going to hand over to, to Richard now. He's going to lead the Q&A. And hopefully we'll get through at least a few of the questions. I know it. There's a lot of questions, but we'll try and get through a few of them, so at least something's so. Thank you, um, over here. I just want to welcome everyone to Word of Faith Christian Center. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Richard Crompton, um, the senior pastor of this, the church, and I want to encourage you, if you are in a church, to be in church on Sunday, but if not, if you're not in a church, we have a service at 8 and 10 o'clock Sunday morning, so I hope to see you there. And then the second thing is, if you have friends or relatives that you think will be interested, uh, we're currently streaming on our YouTube channel, Word of Faith SA. Now You can get the link and send it to them and, and say, tune in. This is an opportunity to hear the Word of God. So, um, I have the great honor of having Amit Safati. Um, Barry Stagner and uh, Mike Golay. Did I get it right? Perfecto. Perfecto. Well, thank you very much. So I'm going to be giving some. I'm going to be asking people some questions, and um, and then hopefully they will. Ha ha the panel will have answers. I'm sure they will. So that we're going to kick off with the first question, um, and, and it is: If a country is not a sheep nation. At the day of judgment of nations, how will it affect the individual people? In other words, how will it affect Christians? Amir, would you yeah. like to take that one? Well, <clears throat> in the Bible, there is a set of judgments that the Bible, uh, you know, is, is setting for the end times. It, literally, from the moment we're being taken up, the, we are enjoying the judgment seat of Christ, but then, of course, there's a set of judgments all the way to the great white throne at the very end of the millennial kingdom. Just at the end of the tribulation period, the Bible has both Old Testament reference and New Testament reference for the same exact judgment known as the judgment of the nations or the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And pay attention to this right now, folks. The judgment at the end of the tribulation is not about individuals whether they believe or not believe in Christ. It has nothing to do with that. It's a judgment of nations. The Bible says in, 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 in the book of Joel, Joel chapter 3 verse 1, in Hebrews chapter 2 by the way, it says, in, in those last days I will bring all the nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will enter into judgment with them according to one account, in one account, which is how they treated my people and my land. And the judgment of the sheep and the goats is about how those nations treated Israel throughout the tribulation, towards the end of the tribulation. You understand that? Okay, good. So, remember, remember, Joel spoke about that in the Old Testament. Jesus mentioned that in Matthew 25. We all know about the king that comes and he says, if you did that to the least of my brethren, is it as if you did that unto me? Okay? Speaking of his brethren in the flesh, the Jewish people. There is no person 
excuse me, no nation on planet Earth that can persecute Israel, try to, re, try to destroy Israel and get away with the judgment. You understand that? And that is, so, so if you're asking me if a nation is a sheep or a goat, it depends on how the nation is acting during that time. Now remember, many times a leader is the one that sets the tone for a whole nation. You understand that? And this is why we need to pray that South Africa will have a leader. I know that I might be a politically incorrect right now, but who cares? Leader takes the nation either up or down. You understand that? You can ask the Germans and they'll tell you all about that. And so we need to pray. That's why when you go to vote, it's, it's not just voting for a person into office, it's voting for the future of a whole nation. And when it comes to the future of Israel and the nation's relation to Israel, it has to do with the great judgment. So that's what it, the judgment of the sheep and the goats is all about. Obviously, what triggers you to take care of the Jewish people is, of course, understanding who they are in the eyes of God. You understand that? So that's how I see it. It's not about believers or non-believers, necessarily. This is not, it's about nations and the way they treated Israel. That's what the scriptures are saying. Now the day will come that every person that ever lived will have to stand before the Lord and have to, and the Lord will check whether his name is in the stack of books or in the Lamb's book of life. And that is the only criteria by which you are either enter the new Jerusalem or not. It has nothing to do with anything else. So, the sheep and the goats is directly connected to anti-Semitism, to persecution, to dividing the land, and all of those things. And so remember that some people here are from Oslo, from Norway, South Africans moved to Oslo and Norway, and, and we talked about it in the, uh, in, uh, in the break. There's a spirit. Oslo Accord is not just an accord. It's a spirit that is, the land does not belong to Israel only. Or maybe the land does not belong to Israel, period. I know of pastors of large churches that teaches Israel today is actually replaced by the church. And therefore, all the promises regarding the land for Israel are now to be obtained by the church. And I want you to remember that Jesus said, look at the fig tree. When you see that its leaves are coming out, you know that summer is near. He could have said, look at the olive tree or look at the vine. He did not. Olive and the vine are trees that represent Israel's Israel religious and spiritual privileges. And by accepting the Lord, you're now part of that family. You have been grafted in. You're now part of the vine. You're part of the olive tree. But you will never be part of the fig tree. Why? Because you, fig tree is the national privileges. It's the land, it's the capital, it's the language, it's the flag, it's the hymn. That, that's something you as Christians can see. Not be part of, Israelis are part of it. When you become a believer in Jesus, your capital is not Jerusalem and your language is not Hebrew and your, your passport is not Israeli. You know, but your God is the God of Israel. Your Messiah is the, 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 the Holy One of it. You see? And that's why Jesus said, when you see the fig tree, not when you are the fig tree, that's when you know that summer is near. Israel is not only playing a significant role in God's faithfulness towards that nation, but also in the way God wants to deliver a message to the whole world that there is a generation that shall not pass away. And this is our generation today.
Amen. I don't know how I started in one I, I, place and ended up in another. I think Mark wanted to pick something up there. Yeah, just to expand on that, when you have in the Hebrew Bible, and even though the New Testament is written in Greek, the mentality of the authors often shines a Hebraic mindset mm -hmm. through. So the nations, or as it's said in the Old Testament, is goyim, or Gentile. So as he said, the nations, the Gentiles, they have to discern whether they want to be a sheep or a goat based on their behavior of how they treat Israel. And that is why we, oh, the people living in the tribulation, the non-believers that do not get raptured, whatever nation of Gentiles they believe in, they have to figure out ways to help Israel, to recognize what God's plan is. I don't know how many are going to do that. Probably not a ton. But it will be judged at the very end. Make no mistake about that. Two things, briefly. Number one, as far as it uh, pertains to the retributive justice of God, Jesus paid it all. There is no judgment for us determining our eternal destiny. That was satisfied on the cross. So in, in the, that sense, judgment has been satisfied. Uh, secondly, if we look at the Olivet Discourse, Jesus takes the context outside of the 70th week of Daniel through the phrase, as it was in the days of Noah. So he's pointing to a time that was prior to the global wrath of God. So what he tells us is prior to the next time of the global wrath of God, it will be as it was in the days of Noah. What are Christians going to experience? They're going to experience a world where the thoughts and intents of man's heart is only evil continually. They're going to experience a time where the world is filled with violence as it was in days of Noah. They're going to experience a time where people are going to see that judgment is impending, yet have a business as usual attitude, buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage. And with all the signs that we see happening around us today, I'd say we need to be looking up because our redemption is nigh. Just, just picking up on that scripture, as in the days of Noah, they'll be eating and drinking. And of course, the food channel, we've never looked so much at food. So food channel is a key sign that Jesus is coming soon. I'm not joking. I really believe that. <laughs> so um, I have another question. Um, Ezekiel's temple, what is that? When is that? When is that going to happen? Well, um, it's important that we understand that... God always wanted to dwell among his people. And we all know that that fellowship was broken in the Garden of Eden. And we all know that then God ordered Moses to have a tent of meeting, Ohel Moed. And later on, Solomon is the first one to build a permanent house for the Lord. Then that was destroyed. Then came the second temple, which has three phases. A Hasmonean um, uh, uh, phase. Actually, yeah, it's Hasmonean phase, and then later on, Herodian phase. And, and we know that that particular temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And from that point on, no more temples were standing on the Temple Mount until today. Now, the Bible is telling us there will be a third temple, a temple that will be there at the time of the rule of the Antichrist. This is something we hear about both in Daniel chapter 9 and certainly both in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That temple will be destroyed at the return of Jesus to Mount of Olives when his feet are standing on that mountain. The mountain will part half to the north, half to the south with a valley from east to west and the entire Mount Moriah today will be gone. Therefore, Ezekiel's temple, the temple of the millennial kingdom, the temple where Christ himself will sit and reign, a temple that will have only a symbolic um, um, uh, sacrificial ceremonies, because obviously he paid for it all, but for those people, they don't understand what has been paid for them. So there is sacrificial ceremony. That temple, as Pastor said, is described in the latter cha uh, 10 chapters of Ezekiel in, with enormous dimensions, far greater than anything that the first, the second, or the third will be. 
And the only place, if you think about, if you look at the geography of Jerusalem today, and you want to imagine that that temple will also be in what's left from Mount Moriah, believe it or not, the only place that it can sit, be situated is further up north. And I don't know if you know, but the extension of Mount Moriah towards the north is where the garden tomb is today, where Golgotha is today. And it's going to be very interesting that right in that area, he himself will reign from Jerusalem over the whole world. So the Ezekiel temple is the fourth temple. It's the temple of the millennial kingdom. It will be there from the moment Christ returns to earth to the end where we have the great white throne of judgment. And then, of course, he will make all things new. That's what that temple is all about. It's not the first. It's not the second. It's certainly not the third. And regarding the third, we will not be here to see it. Let me explain why. The third one is a fruit of in some sort of agreement. You know, Israel cannot just build a third temple whenever it wants. When will that agreement be? When radical Islam will be defeated on the mountains of Israel in Ezekiel 38. And the Antichrist will rise and introduce seven years peace treaty. And we know that after that temple is standing, halfway through, that same Antichrist will walk in and declare himself as God in that temple. So that temple will rise when the Antichrist will rise and will eventually fall when Jesus returns, but it will change in the middle from the temple of God to the temple of the Antichrist, basically. But you need to remember, we are not to see the Antichrist. Because we have the restrainer within us, the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that the only thing that stops the Antichrist from showing himself is the restrainer. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, once the restrainer is taken out of the way, then that man of lawlessness will appear, will, will reveal himself. So we need to be out of here it's the, I call it the great exchange. Fight in heaven, the dragon is being thrown down, and we go up. And then he does all of his shenanigans here on earth with his minions. And for those seven years that he's ruling here, we're up there. Yeah. We will not have to deal with all of this. Just to comment on this, what we call the Millennial Temple, or the, the Temple of Ezekiel from chapter 40 till, till the latter parts of the book, it has exact dimensions, number one. In fact, it has so exact dimensions that you can actually construct a model to scale. That's number one. So a lot of people have tried to allegorize it because the main struggle is, it says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus atoned for our sins once and for all. Now, notice this, though, because I do believe this temple, as Amir has illustrated, will come after the judgment of the sheep and the goats, and the people go into the millennial kingdom, which has been prophesied by the Old Testament prophets themselves as a kingdom where their king rules and reigns, and there will be a place of worship. That's the key place. Well, you say, well, wait a minute, not so fast. I thought Jesus atoned for all the sins once and for all. Yes, but the same book of Hebrews also says that all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament system, of all those temples, never truly atoned, and that will be the same case for the Millennial Temple. They were all shadows of the reality to assist the person, as Amir said, to truly worship and appreciate the actual sacrifice that Jesus accomplished on the cross. I think modern church world, because we do not see the brutality and the sheer payment of sacrifice, I think the blood of Christ in a lot of churches around the world has unfortunately been cheapened to a cheap grace. But when you actually have visual, illustrative sacrifices that are regular part of your schedule and your diet, you really get to see the reality of what Jesus accomplished as he's literally ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. So I, I would say to the skeptic who says, 
There is no literal temple. There's literal dimensions. It's predicted in the Old Testament. And just like the first temples, this one also does not truly atone. It's Jesus before he came as a shadow and after a remembrance. Am I... Um, just a question of topography. Am I correct that the garden tomb is the highest point of Mount uh, Moriah? The, the, the garden tomb yes. is the highest point yes. of Mount Moriah. And it will not be destroyed because it's not on the valley that is directly in front of the, the Mount of Olives. This is why it's quite amazing yes. that what's left from Mount Moriah is actually where he was crucified and buried eventually. So it's, it's very interesting. The next question we have is, your message made reference to Luke 21, 28. There is much controversy re, pre and post tribulation. As there is no time frame, how can we be certain it is pre according to scripture? Well, it depends how you want to get to heaven. <laughs> Raw, medium, or well done. <laughs> now, let me be more serious. The only option that also fits the, the uh, no one knows the day and the hour. The only option is before. Why? If it's in the middle, if there is one time period, we know how long it is, number of days, weeks, months, and years, it's a tribulation. The Bible gives us an exact description of the number of days even. 1260, 1260 we know exactly, okay? So that's one thing, okay? Second, what's the purpose of beating up your bride and then marrying her, okay? Think about it, unless you're sick, okay? But, okay, now if you believe it's at the end of the tribulation, you also have a problem. What's the problem? Also at the end, you know exactly the day. Plus, what's the purpose of taking you and bringing you back again? It's a bungee jump? I mean, hop up and down? What's the purpose of taking us if he's returning at the end to reign and rule here? So the only option that answers that no one knows the day and the hour, answers the character of God, that that's the bride of Christ. He will not harm her. And also makes sense that he takes us and not immediately throws us back. It's the pre-tribulation rapture. And so, I, I'm glad, I'm happy, and um, I'm happy to prove you wrong if you're a mid or a post trip. That's it. I think one of the most obvious uh, ways that we arrive at this particular interpretation of the timing of the rapture is the church wasn't here for the first 69 weeks of Daniel, so why would we be here for the 70th? doesn't even make any sense. It's inconsistent with what has happened in time past. And if you add to that what Amir mentioned a moment ago from 2 Thessalonians, the lawless one cannot be revealed until the church is taken out of the way. Well, the elevation of the lawless one to a global status as a diplomat is what begins the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, we see the rider on the white horse who has a covenant in his hand. The word there is bow. But if you look back in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, you'll find that the word in Genesis for the rainbow is the same word translated as bow in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, which gives us a precedent in the Old Testament for a bow being representative of a covenant. So the Antichrist rides onto the world scene with a covenant in hand to begin the tribulation period. Second Thessalonians said that can't happen until the church is gone. So if his rise to power begins the tribulation, we have to be gone before the tribulation, before he rises to power. Yeah. So just a few more thoughts. Let's, let's just say, let's put the scripture aside. Let's go back in time and let's ask the first century church leaders like Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, who wrote the book of Revelation, or Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, 
or some of the other church fathers that wrote about the rapture. They, all the way up to about 200 A.D., were unanimous in their view that the rapture is a scriptural doctrine of being taken. And until about 200 A.D., they all believed that it was pre-tribulational. They did believe that the church should emphasize holiness, walk with the Lord for readiness. They did believe and actually made a case based on Elijah and Enoch. Irenaeus in book five of Against Heresies contends for that, saying if these guys were snatched, so also could the church, because there were many heretical teachers around those days teaching that the rapture does not exist. So if 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 aren't enough to believe in the rapture and the other evidences of Scripture, you have to contend with the church fathers that unanimously agreed that the doctrine existed and that it was indeed pre-tribulational. Amen. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a question from Ali Rennie, who's a nine-year-old young lady, and she says, in the second heaven and earth, will people die and go to that heaven? In the, you mean second, in the new in heaven other, and new in the earth? New hev heaven and there is new no earth. death there. There is no death, there is no sorrow, there is no pain, there, nothing. In, uh, in fact, we will have once again access to the tree of life. You understand something, folks? The tree of life existed in the Garden of Eden, and it has not been prohibited. I mean, Adam and Eve were not told not to touch the tree of life. They were told not to touch the tree of knowledge of evil and good. And it, they were so obsessed with that which they're not supposed to that they never even tried the tree of life. And then when they already sinned and took from the tree of knowledge of God, then block their way from running and now taking from the tree of life, lest they will live forever with that sin. Now you need to also understand that the Bible tells us that the tree of life will also be once again in the new heavens and new earth. Therefore, and it's interesting, I love how in Hebrews it says that Jesus became high priest for us by the power of his indestructible life. It's never finished life. This is the source of life. God is the source of life. It is life, truth, and way. And when we have that access to it, when it's there, when we eat from its fruits, when it's always bringing fruits, when the leaves are even healing your emotional wounds, if you have from what you've seen at the end of the millennial kingdom of how so many people after a thousand years turn against Jesus once again, all it will heal the nation. It will bring life to the people. No death no more. In fact, by the way, from the moment we are raptured, there is no more death for us. We receive a new body. The Bible says in, we will have the corruption become incorruption. The mortal will be immortal. That's it. You cannot die anymore. You will not gain weight. And you will never be late. Okay? You must understand, it's the longing of all of us to have our bodies change so the laws of physics will no more apply and we will, boom, be snatched away. No more gravity, no more nothing. We'll meet the Lord in the air to be with him and we will never, ever be away and separated from him again. Wherever he goes, he goes back to the right hand of the Father will go with him. He comes back to earth. We come back with him. He enters the new Jerusalem. We enter with him. We are with him the whole time. There is no death when you are with the source of life. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, 51 and 52 that we're going to put on immortal incorruptibility. And I think John the Beloved described that when he was talking about when we see Jesus in 1 John 3. He said when we see him, we're going to be like him as we see him as he is. So what the question is, is there going to be death in the eternal realm uh, where the believers dwell? Absolutely not. We're going to be immortally incorruptible 
like Jesus. He is an eternal being. We will become eternal beings. And one of the things we have to remember is that God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. And the former things will have passed away. The things that cause pain, the things that cause sorrow, including death, are going to be part of our former existence, not of our future existence that we'll have forever. That's why the Jews have a lot of jokes about mother-in-laws, whether they will be there or not. I'm joking. <laughs> no more pain and sorrow. No, but look, it's just a joke from the Hebrew culture. Yeah. <laughs> I love my mother-in-law, just so you know. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I'm off the hook, I just said it. Mike, tell them about your mother-in-law. <laughs> just so you know, we share the same mother-in-law. We're married to two sisters, so that's... Um, so what do you think about your mother-in-law? We love you, we respect you, and we, we will do anything for you. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I see the... The belief, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I no, I totally believe that. Um, anyway, on that subject, what is the abomination of desolation? Uh, right after we talk about the mother-in-law? <laughs> I'll let you answer because people will think that I connect the dots, so go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Mike, talk to them about the abomination of desolation. Yes, please. He has a wonderful answer for this, I know. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reel this into the more serious part. So Daniel mentions that, that the Antichrist, the, the poser of Israel, will be their friend up until the middle of the tribulation of seven years. So three and a half years in, there is predicted, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse th uh, 24 to 27, that he will betray his covenant with the Jewish people and the abomination of desolation will occur. Jesus refers to it as well in Matthew chapter 24 and he actually addresses the generation of Jews that are living at that time that when you see the abomination of des desolation, get out of Dodge. That's American slang for leave. You are now in the doghouse you will be hunted, they will, hurt. they will want to kill you, they will want to destroy you for the latter half of the tribulation period. And so this is a very real and literal event that is predicted, and the Jewish people will be the brunt of the, consequ of, of the consequences of the hate from the Antichrist and the nations of the abomination of desolation, where the Antichrist himself actually pulls off receiving worship in the temple that they the third temple he will actually be worshiped as god and the jews will say whoa that's that's messed up that's too far i have met enough christians that in their innocence donate for the third temple there's a whole institute in jerusalem for the third temple the temple institute it's very sad for me to see Christians donate to what will be the house of the Antichrist, basically. Make no mistake, there is not going to be a shred of godly presence in that particular building. The building will be built out of an aspiration for God to be there, but it will end up with the Antichrist being there. Now remember, when is it? that it's going to happen right after the, you know, the Ezekiel War when there's been a wonderful victory of God on the mountains of Israel, on behalf of Israel, over the enemies of Israel. And how many times throughout history and in the Old Testament we see God fighting for Israel, gets the victory for Israel, and Israel later on got to worship someone else right after when everything was great. And in their distress, they called upon
upon him, and then he always delivered. This will be exactly the same thing. We have a wonderful victory in the Ezekiel War. Messianic aspirations will be there in the hearts of so many. Then the Antichrist is rising as a man of peace who allows him to build the temple, gives him peace and prosperity and security. They'll look at him as the deliverer, as the anointed one. And then, of course, he will show his true face. And you know, if I go today to most of the Tel Aviv region, for example, it's very liberal, very progressive liberal. Unlike Jerusalem, they, they say in Jerusalem, you pray, in Tel Aviv, you play. Now, you go to, uh, to that area, almost all the agenda of the Antichrist that we can already see in motion, because the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, all of that will be agreed by the people that live there even today. There will be a massive number of people that will follow him, but the orthodox or the conservative Jewish people that will look and see that there is a guy standing in their own temple demanding to be worshipped as God. If 2,000 years ago we did not accept a man as God, why would we accept this one now as God? And by the way, Jesus says when you see that, you don't even have time to run and pack. Run. And we know that he's speaking to the Jewish people because he's not saying run to the plains of, of, of uh, the Netherlands. He says, run to the mountains of Judea. He's saying, pray that it's not going to be on the Sabbath day. Pray that it's not going to be in the winter. Uh, I mean, th these are things that pertain to the Jewish people in the land of Israel and not to any other nation. And so he's warning them, the time is coming when you will see a statue, abomination, standing there where you think you worship me is going to be a statue of the satanic figure that receives his authority and power from the dragon himself, Satan himself. Literally, if I have to say it, Satan will be worshipped in the temple of God. Satan. I'm saying that because you have to understand who gives the Antichrist his authority and power. Satan, the dragon. So the Antichrist is not, you know, uh, something innocent. This is a satanic figure. And when he demands to be worshipped as God, it's not as God. It's Satan who wants to be like God. That is exactly what Isaiah chapter 14 speaks of. He wants to be like God. And even on the temple, on Mount of, of Moriah, he wants to feel what it's like to be the God that is worshipped in the temple of Mount Moriah. So it's always counterfeit. If the Jews worship the God by putting phylactra, tefillin, on their arms and on, on their forehead, what will be his mark? On the arm and on the forehead. He always, always is busy in counterfeit, being like God. And the whole, he the whole essence of the abomination of desolation is for Satan to feel like God for a minute. Worshipped in the temple of God, in the city of God, in the house of God. What it's like. And the true Jewish worshippers that don't let Satan, of course, be the subject of their worship will flee. And God will prepare a place for them in the desert for 1260 days. Now, last thing, and I'm saying something that it's hard for me to say as a Jew, but the prophet Zechariah says in chapter 13, two-thirds of Israel will perish, and only the last third he will bring through the fire and purify. They will be alive. And that is the remnant that will be there when Christ returns. And that is exactly the group that Paul says, all Israel will be saved when the times of the Gentiles have come in. That's the last third. You can imagine how much two-thirds is. 
that will be gone. This is why we need to pray for them. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And the only way Jerusalem will ever have peace is when they have peace with God. And the only way to have peace with God is with the one who made peace between us and God. Amen. Maybe just to follow up on that, on that answer, you spoke of a third of the, gent, of the Israelites returning to Jesus. When will that happen? Zechariah 12. When they look at me, whom they pierced. Look, I'm quoting Old Testament. I'm quoting Tanakh, Zechariah, the prophet. Zechariah. I'm not quoting New Testament. Just so you understand, the prophets already knew that the day will come and the Messiah will return. That same Messiah that they have pierced. In the Hebrew, Vehebitu elav et asher dakaru. They looked at him whom they pierced. Same term, whom they pierced, appears in the book of Revelation also, speaking of the Jewish people. And they mourn and cry and that is a sign of true repentance true repentance is not singing and dancing it's mourning and crying understanding sinful nature understanding the big mistake and asking god for forgiveness and they will return and they will mourn and they will cry and they will and this is the fulfillment i believe because i'm speaking now you need to also uh joking uh, but I believe that he will return to Israel on the Feast of Trumpets. They will accept him on the Feast of Yom Kippur. And they will enter into the Millennial Kingdom as the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so the latter feasts will be fulfilled with Jesus in Jerusalem, with Israel, just as the first four were fulfilled with Jesus, with Israel in Jerusalem. Okay, and what about the rapture? The rapture has nothing to do with the feasts because we are not waiting for the trumpet of men in a synagogue. We are waiting for the trumpet of God. Looking at the alliance formed between Iran, Turkey, and Russia, how far is the Ezekiel 38 war? And will we be going home before, during, or after this war? Have volunteered. Yeah, I think <clears throat> we've talked about this. I think you even mentioned it. It seems pretty clear that the Isaiah 17 1 fulfillment is going to be the catalyst that puts the hook in the jaw and brings, even though the motivation will be economic, but it's kind of the last straw type of thing that causes the coalition forces to invade Israel from the north. And, you know, one of the things I think that's important for us to recognize, especially when we're, everybody wants to know when. When's this going to go down? What's going to happen when? How close are we? And, and I think this is one of the prime examples. You know, when God sets things in motion, uh, they reach a point where, with the rebirth of the nation of Israel, that's why Jesus said, this generation will not pass away. In other words, within a short span of time, all the things he talked about in the Olivet Discourse are going to happen. We don't need to spend our time, you know, some people said a generation's 40 years, so the rapture has to happen in, in 1988 and all these other things. But what we're seeing right now is the development of things that are going to be fulfilled during the tribulation. So if we are that close, then we ought to be living every single day when we get up out of bed thinking perhaps today that trumpet's going to sound, the dead in Christ are going to rise, and we who are alive and remain are going to meet him in the air and forever be with the Lord. Now, there's a lot of different interpretations regarding the Ezekiel War scenario. Uh, I personally believe that because of how the battle ends, that it ends during the tribulation because it is a divine act that brings it to an end. Now, we look at what the, the church age has seen regarding the treatment of Israel during its existence since 1948. And listen, if there was ever a group that was worthy of the direct wrath of God, it was the Nazis. And yet, we don't see hailstones of fire mingled with blood and flooding rain and all of those types of things because those things are specific to the 70th week of Daniel. 
And that's how the Ezekiel War scenario is going to end. It's going to end with God's direct cataclysmic wrath on the invading nations. And I think there's a lot of things we need to look at through that lens because one, the nations that are named in the Ezekiel War scenario, except for Russia, represent 95% of radical Islam. And we know the uh, Muslims are never going to agree with the temple being rebuilt on the Temple Mount. But think about this. If these nations invade Israel from the north and God completely decimates them and five, six of the invading armies lay dead on the mountains of Israel and God also destroys their homelands, who's going to argue with the Jews building a temple? God will have instantly wiped out radical Islam. The church has to be gone because the church is a hindering force to all these things uh, that are going to develop. We have to be out of the way. Radical Islam is never going to go along with someone who is a non-Muslim leading the world. So radical Islam has to be out of the way. And there has to be a moderate uh, representation of all world religions in order to bow down to the religion of the Antichrist, to the second beast, the false prophet. So, you know, there's a, this is a debated issue, and I don't want to be overly dogmatic about it, but I think that we are close to the decimation of uh, Damascus, Syria. And as Amir pointed out, that city has been consistently inhabited for 4,500 years. It is the oldest consistently inhabited city on the surface of the earth. And it has never, as he said, some people say, well, Sennacherib wiped it out. No, he didn't. How do we know? Uh, there's, a Syria, there's a Damascus today. So it wasn't wiped out. It will never be inhabited again. So it's simply, uh, its presence says that's not true. So I believe, and I think you do as well, that this is a mic, I know. This is the catalyst that starts that whole process in motion. Damascus is destroyed. Not long after that, the Ezekiel invasion begins, and then God responds, and, and somewhere in there uh, is the rapture of the church. So... But what we do know is that it is God himself who fights for Israel at that point in time. And in order to convince the world that it makes sense that we're gone, they're going to start pumping aliens and aliens and aliens cosmic and cosmic cleansings. And suddenly, we're all talking about it. Suddenly, the U.S. government releases information about this and information as if there's no problems in the world. We're now talking about some flying objects and uh, other things. And, and then when, when we're gone, oops, you know, somebody took them, oh, never mind, and, and that's it. Well, I don't think we'll be missed, just so you know. I think we'll, they'll celebrate when we're gone. We are the hindrance, remember. Party will begin when we're gone. But we have a different party. We, listen. We have a wedding to attend. Wait a minute. And we cannot be late because we are the bride. Hello? And we better look nice and not battered. And no. <laughs> We need to look like the bride should be. Okay? So, pre-tribulation rapture. There you go. What, what does it mean when the scripture says the dead in Christ will rise first? I thought to be absent from the body meant we were present with Christ. Who are the dead in Christ? Oh. First of all, what happens if you die tomorrow? Since Jesus resurrected from the dead, no longer those who are faithful to God are kept in Sheol. They are immediately in the presence of God. Okay. However, their body is still here. So there is a separation of the soul from the body. The body is here. Everybody's crying. But they're not here. That soul is up there in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says that when he comes back to take us, he will bring the souls of everyone who died prior with him, and they will reunite with their new body that is resurrected, and they will receive a glorified body so they can also be with us, just like we do. You understand? So we, if we're still alive, will change uh, while we're alive. They will be reunited with their souls as Christ comes back 
and their body is resurrected, changed, and glorified. And so the dead in Christ are those who died as believers. And they're, it's not really death because they're already in the presence of God, but they still have some bones and body here and whatever it is, and they will receive a new one that will reunite with their souls, and they will be like us and with us, with him, for those seven years, and then we'll re- be there for the marriage supper, for the wedding, and then we'll come back with him and reign with him and rule with him. So uh, these are the dead in Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why Paul referred to death in 1 Corinthians 15 as sleep. He said, we shall not all sleep. First, Corinthian, or, uh, first century Christians well understood that the body's position in the grave was only temporary. So they used sleep to describe it, knowing full well that uh, the soul would be in the presence of the Lord, as Amir said, and the body's uh, decaying condition inside the grave was temporary. So they just likened it to sleep. That's why Paul said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So uh, this does not teach soul sleep, as some uh, erringly teach. The soul does not sleep. The soul is eternal. And uh, the Christian soul goes immediately into the presence of the Lord. And there's been a lot of talk and books written about the uh, temporary body that is inhabited in heaven uh, as, a, as a soul. And, you know, the intermediate state, as it's called. And um, I don't know. Uh, all I do know is that when we die, 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, we will be present with the Lord. And someday, if we die, we'll be reunited united with a, a glorified body. I'm looking forward to that glorified body. Aren't you? These bodies are wearing out. And I, I'm ready for a... I just had hip replacement three months ago. I'm ready for a whole new package. So, amen. Free of charge. So I know we're running a little over time, but I wanted to take a simple poll coming off of the answers to this. So if if, the question I have for you is, A, would you prefer as a believer to to pass away and then be the first ones to reunite with your body, which is new? That's A. So die first and then get a new body. The pro, the pro there is that you're the first, you get your bodies first before the rest of us all that are still alive. Um, or B, you would like to see Jesus in the air and then your body right now changes and then you go be with him. How many of you are in the A camp? You want to die first and then be re- reunited? A few of you? How many of you, how many of you want to see Jesus and all of a sudden, bam! <laughs> so most of us. Yeah, no more headaches, backaches, no more ingrown toenails, no more eyeglasses, no, no, more, no more fat. I mean, I think we won't, I, yeah, things like that. I mean, the body that we'll have is the full extent of the salvation process. And I believe that's why the Bible teaches on it. And I also believe that's why the first century church taught on it. And I believe that every century from there on was excited about it. And here we are, and the time is still ticking, and we have all of those things going on that Amir outlined tonight happening right now. It should really wake you up. If, if I may venture, I think that one of the things in understanding that question is that Jesus returns, he's returning to this earth. And without a body or an earth suit, the people who, the souls who've been in heaven cannot exist on earth. That's why their bodies have to be formed. They need a body. Otherwise, they can't be here. And we're all going to be here with Jesus in a new Jerusalem, new heaven and a new earth. That's very well put. Thank you. (laughs) Um, Which brings me to the next big question. Will the the new body allow us to eat more milk tart? (laughs) I think maybe... (laughs) I think maybe um, just to close off um, this question, we the church in South Africa know we are commissioned to pray for Israel and Jerusalem. What does the Lord want us to pray for exactly? First of all, there is the things that we know that are going to happen and there are the things that we're instructed to do. 
in not they're not you know uh, uh, contradicting each other. We know Jerusalem will have many wars, but we ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We know that many Jewish people will not believe, but we ought to pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. These are two different things. You see, we are instructed. I'm, I'm looking at the heart of Paul when he wrote the epistle to the church in Rome. He never been to Rome before when he wrote it. He wrote pure doctrine. Those 16 chapters were pure doctrine. And in that doctrine, Israel is in every chapter almost. And when he starts with chapter 1, it was, you know, you know, uh, that um, to the Jew first, and then also to the Greek, and then he moved on to chapter two, where he says even tribulations comes on the Jew first and to the Greek, not just you know the blessing. But then he move on and talk about it, and then of course the crescendo is chapter nine, ten, and eleven. And if you read the beginning of chapter nine and the beginning of chapter ten, you and the beginning of chapter eleven, you see the heart of Paul based on the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is obviously the heart of God. The heart of God is that my heart, he says, is that they will be saved. He says the problem is that they try to establish their own righteousness and not rely on the righteousness of God, which is Christ himself. But he says the heart of God is that they will be saved, which means we need to pray for their salvation. The heart of God is that they will enjoy eternal life. That means we need to pray for that. The heart of God is that Israel will dwell in peace. That means we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's, and we need to live in, within those two truths that our job is to pray and intercede, but we also know what's going to happen. And might be, maybe because of that, we need to do it even more fervently. Um, and again, remember, <laughs> there's going to be a time when God will judge every single nation that did the opposite, that harmed the Jews, that persecuted the Jews, that divided their land, that divided the people, that sold the people. God, look, if God will not allow a person or a nation to enter into the millennial kingdom based on how they treated Israel, how much more he expects from his children to love Israel, pray for Israel, and be on Israel's side. Someone asked me, what do you think about if somebody is a Jew hater? I say he doesn't know Christ. How can you know Christ and be an anti-Semite? It's beyond me. You understand what I'm saying? That's not the heart of the, the God that I serve. It's not the heart of the Messiah that I serve. It's certain, so I'm saying... We are required, we are obligated, we are ordered, we are commanded to bless Israel. Regardless of what we, the Bible says, you know, uh, you know regarding the gospel, they're your enemies, he says. But regarding the promise, they are beloved for the sake of the, you know, for the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable, he says. And he says, all you need to do is you pray and God will do the rest. You support and God will do the rest. But remember, and the last thing I will say is this, it's nice to support and it's nice to give and it's nice to help, but if you don't give them the Messiah, if you don't tell them about the Messiah, if you don't share with them about the Messiah, how do you expect them to be saved? Don't hide him from them. Preach him to them. You understand? Because there's enough people that they have a heart for Israel, but they hide the Messiah from them. Because they're afraid, because they're embarrassed, they don't want to hurt them. How can you hurt someone when you give him the only way for eternal life? How can you hurt someone when you give him the key to everything? You hurt him when you don't. You hurt him when you hide the Messiah. There is no other covenant with Israel. He himself, Yeshua himself said, I'm the way, I'm truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said it to the Jewish people. Okay? So as much as you pray and support, give them the gospel. Don't hide it from them. 
It's their only hope. Paul said at the very last chapter of the book of Acts, when the Jewish leadership came and met him in his house arrest, he said, I have nothing to blame my people because I understand their blindness. But then he said, it is for the hope of Israel that I am bound in chains. There's only the hope of Israel is the Messiah. And because of him, he is bound in chains, not because of anything else. He named him the hope of Israel. Remember that. I, I think also on that topic is possibly that we need to pray for a government that is better disposed towards Israel here in South Africa. I think that's as important as anything yes. else. Um, I, th I just want to give the panelists, are there any last remarks any of you would like to make? I'm amazed at the South African welcome that we received. I'm amazed at the attendance, at the love, the support. I'm blown away. I want to tell you that uh, you've uh, brought me to tears many times. And this, this is something I will never forget. And we cannot wait to come back here. And uh, yeah. um, I buy a donkey. Buy a I, donkey. I, I just, I just <laughs> buy a donkey. Yeah. I, I, I just want to, you, you were saying how important context is. When you say, yeah, you mean this building. <laughs> yeah, why not? This, this building. <laughs> Great. There you go. Spinning off of the last question, I think that's such a fabulous question, and we all ought to have a heart for Israel. And uh, this is a byproduct of our salvation. And uh, even Palestinian Christians should have a heart for Israel and understand their role in God's divine plan, his redemptive plan. But I think we also live in a time where Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, that is a season where men will not endure sound doctrine, but will rather heap up for themselves teachers because they have itching ears. And they'll be turned aside to fables, which can also be translated as fabrications. The church will be making things up that are popular with the masses. And Paul, rather interestingly, in the format of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he gives the cure before he presents the malady. He says, preach the word. Preach the word in and out of season. Preach the word. Do the work of the evangelist. Fulfill the ministry. And I, I say this at, at every church service at my home church. <clears throat> and this is um, not something any pastor is quick to say. Uh, at least maybe I should just speak for myself. I had to work myself up to this to say it, but it's true. I tell the congregation, don't tell people about this church, tell people about your Savior. Don't tell people about your pastor, tell people about your Savior. You lead them to Christ and then invite them to church. Because we're here to be evangelists, all of us. There's not an exclusive few that we're told to go to the world and preach the gospel. That's the Greek commission of every single Christian who's ever been born again. So, South Africa, tell people about Jesus. Preach the word, amen? Never has there been a time in human history, except for maybe the first century, where we've seen so many prophecies being fulfilled and are about to be fulfilled. If you have skeptical friends or family friends, use Bible prophecy. It's an advantage to you. You can take the times we live in, ask them the hard questions, and show them in the Bible about what we talked about tonight with the coalition, the resuscitation of Israel to its land, the spirit of lawlessness. All of those verses and passages from the Bible that say in the last days this will happen, it's an advantage to you. It qualifies what you're about to say and validifies the Bible that they doubt. 
Don't lose heart, South Africans. As bad as this world gets, you know the Bible said it would. Use it to your advantage. Show your non-believing friends that the Bible was right all along. Give them the dilemma and have them figure out after you pray for them and ask the Lord to open their eyes. And the Lord is very good at doing his job. The question is, will you do yours? Amen. Well, all that's left to do is three things. We need to thank our panelists and especially Amir. Let's give them a clap a hand. Then, secondly, I need to close in prayer, and then um, Amir, Amir is going to speak a blessing over us. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you that your word has gone out. I want to thank you, Father, that, that seed will um, fall on fertile ground. I pray, Father God, that you will allow that, that, that seed to grow and grow strong in our lives. I pray, Father God, that we will seek your return and that we, that we will pray, come Lord Jesus, I bless Israel, I bless this pa the panelists, and I bless all those who have attended, both online and here. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful evening. Amen. Amen. And I will ask you to stand up and open your arms to receive the blessing. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26, the blessing that uh, was commanded to bless the children of Israel. In Hebrew and in English, I'll do it. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panavelecha v'yichuneka. Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasemlecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be uh, gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. And we pray that in the name of the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Peace, that can give you peace here and everywhere, now and forever. His name, His Yeshua, is our salvation. And in His name we pray and all of God's people say, Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. And don't lose your blessing as you leave through the parking lot. <laughs>